and I want to say thanks to everybody. Thank you all for being here. I'm Tom Hogan, and I'm the coordinator of the uh, Milwaukee Poetry Series. And thank you very much for coming out tonight with uh, everything going on. Uh, I've talked to a couple of people, and uh, I've had to admit that it's a little hard not to shake hands <laughs> or to give some people hugs. Yeah. And that is what we want to do, but we're trying to maintain our, our social distance. Uh, Kim and I talked about that and, and make sure everybody is, is as safe as we can be. So I think a couple of housekeeping things, you know where the bathrooms are, right across the hall, and there are hand sanitizers and, and things in the bathroom if you need to use them. Um, some things are in order. One is to the city of Milwaukee, number one, for uh, their support of the Milwaukee Poetry Series. Uh, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about when I introduce Kim, but Kim was actually our second reader when we started. That was in 2007. And so we are uh, delighted to, to have him uh, back again. City of Milwaukee has been supportive right from the beginning. Uh, we got a grant through the uh, Clackamas County Arts Alliance then the next year, the, uh, the city picked up their support, and we're in our 13th season now. So we're absolutely delighted about that. Uh, secondly, I want to say thank you to the Letting Library. And you can, see, you can see the Letting Library. And most of you remember the old Letting Library, which was built in 1956. And a lovely library, two stories, uh, but small. And it did need to be replaced, so we have a, a lovely a lovely new library, which uh, you, are, you are in now. And thirdly, thanks to the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee. And we're very excited. We have two new committee members. I'm going to ask them to, if they would stand in just a minute. And so we can, uh, we can thank them. I'm already standing. Uh, Emmett, Emmett Wheatfall. And where are, where are Brett and uh, Brett, Brett Kelver and uh, Bev Spurgeon? And uh, Bev is our uh, videographer. So thank you, very, uh, thank you very much for doing that. We do have uh, broadsides. So if everybody didn't get a broadside, I think one of the, um, my lovely wife, Jane, will pass broadsides out. We are asking people to sign in, if you would. We're trying to build our list of, of emails. And we'd also like to know who, have a record of who all is here. So if you're willing to do that, that would be great uh, if you would. We also have some uh, flyers back there of other Milwaukee Poetry Series uh, activities. The things we have coming up are John Sibley Williams is uh, here next week or next, next month uh, in April. And we, do, we are co-hosting another bilingual reading with the El Mutanabe Street Starts Here Coalition. Uh, that's going to be at the Central Library downtown on Saturday, March 28th, 2.30 to 4.30. And these are poems that are read in both English and Arabic. So I want to invite everybody to, uh, to join us. There is going to be an invitation specifically about that. And we do also uh, sponsor open mics. So there is going to be the next open mic is going to be here in this room, and it's going to be on April 1st. <laughs> so it's really going to be on April 1st. And the, uh, the theme of the reading is going to be uh, humor, humor and uh, April Fools. So I'd like to remind you about your uh, telephonic devices, uh, if you would silence them so we don't have any, anything going off. Beepers, pagers, like mine. See, I did this as a test. That's a reminder that we want to uh, silence our telephonic devices. So we, we do take a video of this, and videos play on the Milwaukee Cable Access Station, and they also play, and Sarah Roller uh, from the library also does, she uh, posts them on YouTube. So in about, I would say five weeks or so, the, the one for this reading uh, should be available, but the ones for other readings are, are available. So you can look in, and look in on YouTube. Well, this brings me to introduce our poet tonight. We're uh, absolutely uh, delighted uh, to have Kim here. He's going to tell you a little bit about how the program is going to proceed, uh, because you, you see that uh, it will include harp music. I alluded earlier that Kim was our 
second reader in the series, December of 2007. I think I heard him read probably for the first time in 2006. It was at a picnic at the, uh, the Friends of William Stafford. Friends of William Stafford used to sponsor a picnic uh, in September on, uh, and Saturdays. And it was about Bill Stafford and reading poetry and so forth. So I think that's the first time that, that I heard him. Uh, he was here to, uh, again in the uh, Stafford Centennial, which was uh, 2015. So he's, uh, he's here again with us tonight. He's the founding director of the Northwest Writing Institute at Lewis and Clark College, and the author of a dozen books of poetry and prose, including The Muses Among Us, Eloquent Listening and Other Pleasures of the Writer's Craft, and A Hundred Tricks Every Boy Can Do, How My Brother Disappeared. <laughs> he has taught writing in dozens of schools and community centers. He's much more widely published uh, than that, than the uh, two that uh, I have just listed there. He's also uh, taught writing in Scotland, Italy, and Bhutan. In 2018, 2018, he was appointed Oregon's ninth Poet Laureate by Governor Kate Brown. So would you join me in welcoming our reader tonight, Oregon's Poet Laureate, Mr. Kim Stafford. Agenda in a time of fear, be not afraid. When things go wrong, do right. Set out by the half light of the seeker. The well lit problem begins to heal. Learn tropism toward the difficult. We have not arrived to explain, but to sing. Young idealism ripens into an ethical life. Prune back regret to let faith grow. When you hit rock bottom, dig farther down. Grief is the seed of singing, shame the seed of song. Keep seeing what you are not saying. Plunder your reticence. Songbird guards a twig, its only weapon, a song. Proverbs for dark times. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for letting library, for all of you to, shall I say it, risk your life for poetry? <laughs> the few, the proud, the foolish. Uh, well, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to read a few poems, and then Bethany's going to come up, and we're going to collaborate on a few pieces. Um, once you have, as a poet, performed a poem with harp, you never want to go back. <laughs> the poems will just melt into the ether, and uh, they become so much more beautiful with Bethany's playing. Then I'll do a few more poems, and then Bethany will do a song of her own, and then we'll do a few poems, and then we'll have a Q&A. And the microphone will move around, so you can be thinking of your, your questions. Um, I want to start with my blessing called All My Relations. All My Relations. I want to thank all my relations for this chance to be on earth in her time of flourishing to thank the first people of this place, to honor their sovereignty in long and continuing relation, still teaching us how we might be here together. To thank my mother and father, moon and sun, for setting me forth before their own passing on. I want to thank my grandmother who listened to me so eloquently, I learned to listen to my own heart and mind to find songs and stories there. I want to thank my family and friends and all citizens and travelers who study and work for deeper kinship with this place, with one another, and with all creatures, one earth, visible, palpable, fragile, intricate, resonant, 
in need of our better stories. I want to thank you who have gathered here to receive what I have carried in hope that something I have may meet something you need so that all our relations may be strengthened for this life we live together. Amen. So, um, I was telling my friend Diane, friends Diane and Scott here that I've been waking up with a phrase, uh, just out of nowhere. Sometimes in the middle of the night, sometimes when I wake up at 4.30 or 5, and sometimes I just laugh out loud. That is so ridiculous. Where did that come from? And I think this is maybe the next step of the writing practice. You know, if you have a writing practice, your subconscious gets on board and starts just, you know, pitching you, hey, try this out, think about this. So uh, the other night, it was, I was coming out of a dream of a political speech in which the, the, the speaker was all excited. He was just in a frenzy. And the first line of his speech was, I believe in the kumquat. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, I need to write about that. So this is, um, this is called stump speech. And I hope it'll, you know, in keeping with the frenzy of politics, but I hope it'll give us a little relief. I believe in the kumquat. I will lift up the lowly. I will look out for the little guy. Have you felt insulted in the produce aisle? Grapefruits in their roly-poly magnificence? Bananas with their gigantic hands? Kiwis in their creepy fur coats? <laughs> Don't get me started on oranges with their fat cat swagger. I'm tired of pride, aren't you? I'm sick and tired of how the high and mighty think they own the whole damn store. I mean, really, what's a lemon got that you ain't got? Where is your red delicious when you need the puckish elegance of a kumquat? You're no condiment. You're no side dish. You're no decoration, accent. You got mojo no other citrus can touch. You're small, but you pack a punch. A punch. Know what I'm talking about? I will work for you. Get you featured on the special weekend ad. Give you recipes, spill you into bins, to glisten and reveal your lineage from the sun. Let's get one thing straight. You deserve this. You've worked for it, am I right? I can't hear you, am I right? <laughs> okay then, now's your time. Elect me and I'm yours. <laughs> yeah. Politics could be festive. We need poets on the team. Okay, so, um, Speaking of the legacy of uh, this series, uh, my predecessor, the eighth poet laureate, Elizabeth Woody, uh, gave her last reading, I think, as poet laureate in this series. And she said a couple things in that reading that just became my uh, launching pad as poet laureate, as the ninth poet laureate. One thing she said was, you know, the more I do poetry, the less it's about what the poem is and the more about who the poem serves. So that idea of a poem serving someone. And I took that as my mission statement as poet laureate. Who can a poem serve? So um, back in September, I realized up at Timberline they were having uh, the centennial, the anniversary of uh, FDR coming and you know blessing Timberline Lodge. And so I called him up and I said, this is the poet laureate. Um, <laughs> You should have me do a reading up by the fireplace. And they said, oh, okay. And then I said, and while you're at it, you should have Elizabeth Woody come. She'll come from the east, I'll come from the west, and we'll read together. So we, it was the, there was this freak snowstorm in September. We, it was a whiteout, and there we were, and the fire was crackling, and the people who were stranded in the lodge had to listen to this poetry reading <laughs> with Elizabeth and me. So I wrote this poem for you know, who does the poem serve? For Elizabeth. Because she, for years, has called me my long lost brother. It's very moving to me, my long lost brother. So this is called My Long Lost Sister. She is born to the bitter water clan, to the people of the hot springs, to the people of water's echo. I am born to the clan of the spare prairies, people of the small church, clan of the peace warrior. 
She lives beyond the mountain on the dry side. Fewer people, more stars. I live in the city on the wet side. Feverish bustle wires across the sky. For her, light is a prism that reveals a kind of cut bead glitter I can't see until she tells me, reveals the hidden. For me, the sound of water flowing from sleep to be syllables chanted, scribbled, given. At the root feast once an elder stood and said, I looked into the fire to see if there were any words. I saw them. I would say them for you. He spoke for my sister. And at the root feast once, another elder stood and said, down by the corner was a song, waiting to see if anyone would hear it. I heard it. He spoke for me. Two birds singing in one thicket, two streams flowing from one mountain, if we follow the lineage back far enough, at the source, one song sings. My sister works to hear it. I work to hear it. Tonight she comes from the east, I from the west, to meet on the mountain beside the fire at Timberline, to be born to the clan of now. Okay. I'm going to do one more poem, and then we're going to have Bethany come up, and the magic will begin. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes I wake up with a phrase. Sometimes uh, I overhear something someone says, and, you know, I'll put that in my little notebook, and then the next day, you know, I get it out, and, oh, yeah, what was that? I better, that's my writing prompt for today, you know, see where that goes. Uh, sometimes I just think of a phrase that's a, sort of the more ordinary, the better because there are these cliches. Um, when I was in college, I went to a poetry reading by a poet named Charles Simic, and he, he, I bought his book, and he wrote on the uh, front uh, page, the dream of every honest cliche is to enter a great poem. <laughs> and I love that, you know, not some ethereal poetic language, but to take the language of the street and give it honor. Give it honor. So this poem is called Back in the Day. <laughs> Back in the Day. Remember how we stood around, just stood around on the corner, nudging a pebble with a toe, or bowing to pluck a stem of grass to nibble, to waggle in our lips while we waited for something. Sometimes waiting was what happened. What did you do? Nothing. Or on the porch, sitting, talking, rocking, wondering, watching the street, sometimes a stray dog, the mailman, rain. Remember the deliberate drama of a cloud gliding as it grew, splintering the sun into shadow before it moved on? Instead of looking something up on the glass wafer in your hand, you daydreamed pondered, mused, gazed, got lost in thought. And what came to you then belonged to you, was your offering to others, your voice, your vote. It's still there, my friend, the street corner, the porch, cloud, rain, rich, random thought, and your empty, open hand. Bethany. So this first poem we're gonna do, it's just called Lessons from a Tree. And it's, uh, it's kind of at the speed of tree. It's just a series of sort of word spells. That, well, you'll get the idea.
seeds split, roots sprout, bud leaf. Delve deep, hold fast, reach far. Seed, sway, bow, loom, lean. Climb high, stand tall, last long. Thicken, billow, shade, rain. Grain, ring, grow, sow seed. Wine, sing, flicker, glimmer, rise by pluck, child of luck, lightning struck, survivor. Weather, Hollow, glisten, witness, remember, testify, thicken, burn, bleed, heal, seed, learn, nest, host, Guard, honor, savor, seed again. Fade, groan, sag, crack, split, soften, slough, grip, gather, Arc, swish, sail, fall, settle, log, stump, slump, sag, surrender, offer, enrich, be duff, enough. We rehearsed and I just burst into tears. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just to play it over and over until it's boring, but it didn't work. <laughs> it did not work. So this next one is, um, when I was a kid, we had these books. Oh, books. Books! Do you, anybody read the article about this building in, I think it's Germany. It's it's a mall that doesn't sell anything. It's filled with books, coffee shops, meeting rooms. And you know, it's this big building and people just come there and you know, they said we've got to have the post-capitalist experience. So, you know, maybe the Letting Library is, is the first phase, <laughs> first phase. So, um, books, when we were kids, we were read by uh, our mom Finn family Moomin Troll. Does anyone know Moomin Troll? Oh yeah. Finn so this is this young woman, Tove Jansson, during World War II, she was a teenager, she started to console herself writing about the Moomins, who were these little, like little upright hippopotamuses who, you know, hibernate through the winter and then they come out and 
they have these bizarre friends and there's a hobgoblin and you know just all these wonders um, that's your optional homework look up the Moomin Troll and in Finland there's Moomin Land you know I mean it's a big thing but Tove um, she was actually a very shy person, so her success didn't really do it for her. And so she talked these fishermen into building a hut on an island. It was only, I think, about 30 feet across. And there was a, a loophole in the building code that if you could get the ridge beam on in one season, they couldn't stop you. And so these fishermen, they got all this driftwood, and you know they rushed out there, and they built this hut, and then for years, every summer, she would get dropped off on this island. You know, they, they couldn't even land. The boat would come up with a, a crate full of her food for the summer, and they'd push it toward shore, and she'd jump in and swim, and then she'd just be in this hut. And I just became obsessed with the idea of a, a creative genius in the solitude of the sea. So this is called Tove Jensen, and the piece, do you want to say anything about stones and sea? So this piece has words to it, uh, but it's an ocean piece about uh, uh, the story of a person who's walking alongside the ocean, picking up stones and choosing the beautiful ones. And the wind rises up and says to this person, what are you doing? You are missing the precious thing. Raise your eyes and look to the sea. And so in the story, in the song, this person looks to the sea and realizes what they've been missing all along, and you'd think that's where it would end. But the ocean comes and carries them away. And uh, the song ends saying, the wind rises again and says, you, uh, you fool, you can't contain the ocean like a stone. <laughs> <laughs> Some crazy artist, really. Some crazy artist. Yeah. So Stones in the Sea and Tove Jansung. They say her father sculpted in bronze and her mother designed postage stamps, great forms, and fine detail, her first food. Little hands silently lifting a burin, a mallet, getting the heft of creation. Sun and pollen, ruby ants in a row, her ears filled with the breath of waves, her schooling, a blur of breathless pleasures, far from anything countable. No boy could match a bird's fine wit. When she was grown, a boat would take her to the island without landing, and she would leap into the sea to guide the crate of a summer's simple food to shore as the boat circled away. No clock, no voice, no growl of motor or purr of phone. She would delve into the bounty of her young silence. To hear songs, she let go easy into the wind. But dozing became dreams Dreams became stories, old and odd and shapely, bristling with thought more like pine cones or glittering seams in bedrock than anything anyone had ever known. Stories of summer light, of star seeds concentric around hints, stones hefted like sorrows, Leaves watched unfurling hour by hour. Lit feather optimists lifting away across the sea in the general drift of hidden happiness. When autumn came, the bro boat brought exile, for then she wintered by city ways Streetcar clang, wires across the sky, the naked glory of creation dressed in small decisions, minor laws. 
but summer, 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 story, story, story. Until old, she finished hut empty, pages topped by a stone the sea had shaped with its scarf of centuries and far Her books cupped like islands in children's hands. That kind of got me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, this next one, um, I was out in, you know, the Poet Laureate thing is really cool because you just get to go all these places. Oregon is such an incredible place. And it took me to Paisley. How many people have been to Paisley? All right, highway, is it 61, 31? From La Pine down to Lakeview. And so we went to the uh, basketball game, the Cougars versus the Broncos. With the Paisley Broncos versus the Prospect Cougars and the, the Cougars were just getting creamed. Because Paisley High School in Eastern Oregon is an international school. So on the basketball team, there was a kid from Kazakhstan, Ecuador, Mexico, Thailand, and they were really good. And to hear all these good ranching people going crazy with enthusiasm when the kid from Kazakhstan sunk a three-pointer, I was like, I want America to be like this, you know? So during the first half, word spread through the crowd that the poet laureate was in the house. I don't know how they found out, but. And so this uh, ranch woman came up to me and she said, uh, would you do a poem at halftime? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. You know, so, uh, you know, the buzzer sound, bzz, uh, folks, we got something a little unusual tonight. <laughs> and so I stepped to the half, half the line there in the middle, and, you know, did a poem. And I just realized I have peaked out. You know, this is, this is the peak. This is as good as it gets. But my next thought was, if only it could have been like this in high school. <laughs> You know, when I was 16, if they would have said, will you do a poem from the half line? You'd have to. So anyway, afterward, we went to the saloon, and there was literally a horse tied out in front. And uh, we had dinner, and I was talking to this uh, ranch woman, and she said, I'm about to give up. I'm about to give up on this country. I'm about to give up on this state. I'm about to give up. I can't go to meetings anymore. People shout. You know, we can't even find common ground. We need new ground. And uh, I thought, oh my gosh, if this articulate, connected, intentional person is going to give up, we have a problem. So I decided I am going to make a book for her. And this is, the first, this is one of the poems in that book. It's called Dew and Honey. And uh, do you want to say a little bit about the Manx lullaby? What is that? One of the things I love to do with my harp is play for people in healthcare and hospice situations. And often, uh, the people that I play for can't see a window. Maybe they have become bedridden and their bed is too far away and they don't even know what the weather is like outside. And so this is a piece that I play when it's really sunny outside and I want to bring some of that sunshine in. Yeah. You thought it fit. Yes. It's called Dew and Honey. <laughs> sip by sip, 
in thimble cup, the meadow bees will drink it up, and fairy home to bounty's hive, by flowers flavor hum and thrive, to show us how, through word and song, by gesture small and patience long, in spite of our old foolish ways, we may fashion better days. So my friend, come sip and savor syllables as crumbs of pleasure. By sunrise in our conversations, we begin a better nation. So um, another way writing happens for me is I, I will see a, a quotation from an interview or a poem or a story, and I just think that uh, feels like a seed. You know that that needs to grow. I want to I want to take that seed from another's writing and see how it might grow in my garden. So this is from a, it's called Song After Ishiguro, the author of Remains of the Day and other books. And at one point, um, he said, there was another life I might have had, but I'm having this one. Yeah. You know, which I think is a, a wonderful remedy for regret. You know, if you think the path not taken was the good one. There was another life I might have had, but I am having this one. Mm -hmm. To think the roads I didn't walk, my heart begins to spin. I carry wayward stories of all that might have been. If I were starting over, would I take this life again? Can I savor satisfaction for all I hold within? Win or lose is not the game. With every breath, begin. Those were the lives I've, I might have lived, but this is the one I'm in. To think the roads I didn't walk, my heart begins to spin. I carry wayward stories of all that might have been. If I were starting over, would I take this life again? Can I savor satisfaction for all I hold within? Win or lose is not the game. With every breath, begin. Those were the lives I might have lived, but this is the one I'm in. So I'm just going to do a couple poems, and then Bethany's going to do a song, and a few more little things. And I think we've got them in a trance, Bethany. <laughs> can do anything. So um, I have this friend, uh, Antonio, who, um, when I started this poem, he was undocumented, and by the time I'd revised it, he had his papers. And so. Um, He's just one of my heroes because he is, he's a beautiful hard worker. He's always in a buoyant mood. He does the impossible. 
Uh, I could mention blackberries, I could mention stone walls, I could mention um, gardens. And um, so this is a, a letter to the president uh, that when Antonio read this poem, he cried. Dear Mr. President, in sheer contradiction of your efforts to warn our fellow citizens of the danger of immigrants, a certain Antonio from Michoacan, who has been living without documents as my neighbor for 15 years, has put me to shame with his work ethic, thrift, good humor, and courage. Building stone walls, repairing roads, tilling gardens, and otherwise inflicting beauty and good order on this neglected corner of our nation in spite of all you say to drive him away. You, sir, are not getting through. He keeps smiling and bending to any task we offer for simple wages, humming a song I can't get out of my head or heart. I do not know how to advise you, sir. You have labored long and loud to cast him down, cast him out, but he just keeps humming that song. Que linda esta la mañana en que vengo a saludarte. He is saying, the morning is beautiful, sir. And he greets you, singing. And then I have a poem for my counterpart in Washington, Claudia Castro Luna. She's uh, from Salvador. She came as a student many years ago. She's the poet laureate who's wandering, uh, you know, up and down the Columbia, all through the, the center, the edges of Washington. And she told me the story that she went to Salvador to visit her father, who was not well. And uh, it was dangerous. It was a dangerous journey. Um, and she saw these places she had loved as a child that have just been destroyed. Uh, and so it was a difficult journey. Um, and she was coming back to the airport. Uh, and she went through a lot of devastation. And then she came into a ravine kind of in the mountains where it was all green and there were butterflies. And there was a woman sitting by the road selling little jars of honey. So she bought one. and the flavor of her country, and everything was great till she got to Houston. And then the customs agent, oh, I've gotta take that. So when she told me this, sort of in the spirit of what I learned from um, Elizabeth Woody, I thought, I'm gonna write a poem for the customs agent. <laughs> My compassion for the customs agent. So this is called, For the Customs Agent Who Seized Claudia's Jar of Honey from El Salvador, for Claudia Castro Luna. Para probar, she said, taste it. Let it sizzle on your tongue, take it home, smuggled into your dark pocket, and with a spoon drip to the tongues of your children, slow sips of joy, so they may know how sweet my country once was, in spite of war and sorrow. Tell them about the ravine with flowers the soldiers missed, but the bees swarmed, humming and humming, Zumbando y zumbando. Remind them how a mother could sit by the road with her daughter in her arms and a few jars of true gold. How my coins in her brown hand meant enough this day. Even though her man was gone, even though your law would take this elixir from me, even though there will always be war, but always flowers, bees, mothers, and your children? And if you have no children, if you do not wish to think of war or my country or the woman by the road still, I beg you, taste this honey. Let the sticky song of a thousand bees give your body the oldest, deepest pleasure. Do not lose your chance to know how sweet my country once was in spite of war and sorrow, a pesar de la guerra y el dolor. Bethany.
We're going to do two more pieces together and then have a little Q&A and then a final poll. Um, so this one, uh, you know, I like to, at these readings, give optional homework. <laughs> and uh, one of my favorite optional homework assignments is think of someone in your life who needs a poem and then either find one or write one for that person. You know, so poetry becomes a connector between people. Uh, but another piece of optional homework is to go to rhymezone.com and you just type in any word and it gives you like 50 rhymes, you know, and then you just take a salt shaker and kind of sprinkle them through the poem. So that, that's what this poem does. It's, it's my anthem for the creative process. It's called, I Am the Seed. Every chance I get, any place I fit, in a cleft of grit, in ravine or pit, 
By ancient wit, my husk I split. I am the seed. I fell to the ground without a sound. By rainfall drowned, by sunlight found. By luck profound, by wonder found, I am the seed. After fiery thief, after bout of grief, though life is brief, I sprout relief beyond belief with tiny leaf. I am the seed. I am the seed, small as a bead. Tell me your need, your hunger, I'll feed. Any trouble you're in, I will begin. For I am the seed. Up I rise to seek the prize from all that dies by bold surprise, small and wise before your eyes. I am the seed. So the way I met Bethany was she surrendered to some wild notion to uh, sign up for a class. This was a summer class, but maybe it wasn't a class. It was just we were in, together in this room, and we went around and you know introduced ourselves. And oh, you know I'm so and so. I'm from the East Coast, and I do this and I do that. We got to Bethany, and she said, "Well, I'm Bethany, and I'm a writer, and I play harp in hospice." And you know that the musical note of silence in a room when people sort of, oh. So later in the week, or maybe later that day, I can't remember, I said, would you bring your harp to class? And maybe, maybe it could just be a writing prompt. Like you would just start playing and we just see what happens. So this is what happened when Bethany was playing. It's called, uh, this is what happened on my page. It's called writing class with harp. <laughs> and you know, just as, now I'm totally spoiled. I think that you shouldn't have a poetry reading without a harp. You shouldn't really have a class without a harp either. I mean, once you've done it. I'm going to be busy. Yeah, there's no, you are. Yeah. There's no going back. So writing class with harp. Yes, we could settle for instruction. I could explain the structure of the essay or the rigors of writing great poems. But What's wrong with simple ravishing instead? Our pens were moving, just tuning up the mind. When Bethany embraced her harp, Shenandoah shimmered from her golden strings, and we were helpless, scribing truth long knotted in darkness, now deserving all our light. For the harp has no mercy with the soul. I'm a scholar with a PhD. I have a lesson plan, a packet of readings for our edification and guidance. And this is graduate school after all. But 
Bethany has told us she plays harp in hospice when all has been subtracted from a life but music and a long look. So we write under the spell of Scarborough Fair as if our lives depended on it as they do, for the harp has no mercy with the soul. <laughs> In the catalog online, this was described as a class for writers interested in pushing their practice in multiple directions. But here we dwell inside the mystic architecture of the old Shaker song, The Gift to Be Simple. And it's all simpler than the plan and deeper. There's more at stake than excellence. And so we scribble with gentle fury, more giving and forgiving more patient and sure, for the harp has no mercy with the soul. Craziness abounds. Our lead us, lead, lead us into cruel, unnecessary drama of division without vision, of fear as the coin of the realm, in a long economy of attrition. There is no other name than failure for what fills the news. And yet, when Bethany plays, the water is wide. In our boat to carry through two, we scroll through all our long-hid kinship clues as we row with our pens across the page where the harp has no mercy with the soul. Bethany, stay up here. We're going to have a Q&A. Any questions, thoughts, rebuttals, requests? What do you got? <laughs> well, we got, we got a little bit more. But. So I'm going to try and bring the mic to you. We're going to see if that works. Because we're getting the answer, but not the question. Yeah. When you're reaching full of water, <laughs> And your hat rims all the drip. <laughs> Whenever step your pony takes, it's then you get to thinking. There we go. That's the poem I did in Paisley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He shared that poem with a group of research people trying to set up in the woods and learn stuff 20 years ago. Yeah. It's the only poem I know, so I thought I would thank you for that. <laughs> but all the other poems that I've heard. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that was a deal where uh, up at Yellow Jacket Creek, up between St. Helens and, and Rainier, a bunch of uh, agency folks got together to eat salmon and talk about how to engage the public. 
Yes, please. So I have three items. The first one is I've never been to Paisley in Oregon, although I've been here for 35 years. I have been to Paisley, which is outside of Glasgow. Ah, yeah. yeah. Where bread, industrial bread was invented. And it is the source of empire. Yes, yes. So it's a significant place. That's one. All right. Two, uh, a friend. A friend is somebody that goes to you as you're dying and reads to you a poem. Yeah. Um, Kim and I had the same friend, Tom Jay. Yeah. Uh, but Kim was able to make it and read yeah. him that poem. Half hour to spare. Yeah. And I, I read your poem at the Fisher Poets oh, Gathering, okay. the 23rd Annual yeah. Story. Wow. Wow. And I wouldn't mind at all if you would read his poem, sure. Elder. Oh, yeah, yeah, and sure. Yeah. So this is Tom Jay, who... Uh, he carried this beat up etymological dictionary. And the great thing about being in his presence is you would just go into the Middle Ages, basically, and learn the roots, the old roots of words. And he was very, uh, he was very protective of the meaning of words. Like one of his uh, notions was, you can't call farmed salmon salmon. They have to be called spammon. <laughs> so here's Tom Jay. Elders, salmon, slap, the work scarred, earth curved decks of fishing boats, like blind, abandoned angels knocking at midnight door, bereft. The starry quicksilver glint of the sea suffocating in our mortal air, and then I've heard them slash the laughing rills of moonless winter nights dodging clawed phantoms in the rock-creased stream. But today, watching a water-bright bruise of dog salmon brawl over this haunted gravel for the first time in a decade, I close my eyes and dream of silver-skinned elders, the old ones, spent and weeping in welcome for the clear-eyed rain. Yeah, so t t Tom and the wild Olympic women brought back the salmon to Chimicum Creek after they've been gone for 10 years. That is a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> One more question? I, I didn't have one oh, more okay. question. You had <laughs> Are there any street poets in the house? Yes. Walt is here. <laughs> oh, yes. And, and uh, I have a question. Does the Lenin Library have this? Uh, your winds and. Wind on the waves. Yeah, you have a copy of that one? I don't know. You sign it for them and give it to them. We got a deal. And, and, and my question is. Damn, you're a beautiful human being. Why? Why? I learned it from the best, Walt. And, and, and more than that, uh, Sitka, is that still going on? It's still school? going on. Oh, yeah. Are you still involved with the school? I, I am, yes. And, and you know what? I'm so proud of you, and your father would be proud, and everyone in the room is proud of you, Poet Laureate Emeritus. <laughs> Thank you, Walt. One final question. There's one. If you're reading poetry, I brought Elizabeth's book. Would you read one of them? Oh, let's do that. Yeah, Elizabeth Woody. Oh, Elizabeth Woody, great. Oh, yeah. Boy, the salmon are having their say tonight. <laughs> so, Elizabeth Woody. Um, you know, I just learned so much from her. Like one of her questions that's been haunting me for probably 30 years. She said, uh, can you view the pattern from the perspective of a bead? 
And I realize about her poetry, it's like beadwork. There are these glittering syllables kind of arranged and you know, not bound by syntax alone, but there's a beautiful pattern. So uh, reminiscent of Salmon Woman. Abalone swinging on the ears of salmon women signals the time to witness. The dance of budding camas flowers, yellowtail butterflies and wild roses. Spring in green and blue, light moves water. In one motion, dawn and dusk separate into daylight. Salmon mother at the head of a stream speaks the spawning rush of salmon tails, makes space for row and melt. The salmon's precise eyes glisten. Diamonds reflect dark carbon of age in the center. The passage absorbs the deep voice of her renewal song. The woman's mouth breaks through the surface of tranquility. Elizabeth Woody. Can we give Kim and Destiny another hand? I've got one more poem. One more poem. I want to do two poems. This is my last chance. Okay. Um, so I, I think I better do the broadside poem, and then I have a farewell poem. So, Wild Honey, Tough Salt. And I'm being interviewed on Friday by someone who's doing her dissertation on the creative process. And she asked me to prepare a poem to talk about. And so I started footnoting this poem. <laughs> and it's bristling with footnotes, you know, <laughs> how everything is connected. So wild honey, tough salt. Why do these things come touch my sleeve? A dream of my father working the fields, a bird singing before first light. A sense in my body that now I can do the hard things. I stay in place and changes come to me. I do not move and I am moved. Hold still, crowded by legions of emergency and sweetness. Salt and honey. Harder to tell the difference now. A friend does beauty without cause. It is honey. A friend dies after pure pain. We feel an odd sweetness knowing with a jolt the pure passage. Like the time those monks gave up the old vat of wine, poured it out down the road, a sudden purple scarf along the stones alive with bees and butterflies, gone crazy with sweetness as it passed away. And then this last poem. Um, I wrote for my wife on her birthday, uh, but I haven't given it to her yet. <laughs> it's called, I Will Love You After. In the rain, that's me, touching you more gently than I could with clumsy hands. And the sun, that's me again, but with more radiance than my poor gaze could send. Starlight seeking you, Crickets singing your name, darkness dressing you more purely than I ever could. I will send you bounty, beloved, a feather you hold, a stone you pocket, a friend you find who can be kind to thee. Thank you. <laughs>